Nearly a year ago, I released an hour long video about the entire Postal franchise, in which I concluded I wouldn't cover the fourth game until it was out of early access, as it wouldn't be fair to judge it, and since then, a lot has happened. Most prevalent of which is Postal 4 moving from the super janky alpha to the super janky technically full release, with five whole days for us to break down. This is going to be an interesting morning. The previous entries were dubbed the worst games ever made, something the fourth title revels in, even calling it a sequel to the worst game ever in its own marketing. The franchise has had its highs and its lows, but at its core, it's always been a ridiculous, offensive, gory mess that looks to do nothing more than provide stupid, over-the-top catharsis for players to enjoy. So that leaves the question, where does the fourth game sit amongst this scale? Well, let's take a closer look. The game begins, as you might expect, on Monday. Having left Paradise, Dude is looking for a new place he and Champ can call home. This is a tale of a man only known as the Postal Dude. They stop off at a gas station when the unthinkable happens. His mobile home is carjacked, his last bastion of hope is cruelly ripped away. But all hope is not lost, as they've stopped in near perfect coincidence just outside the town of Edenson. We pull up with no moolah and desperate need of a job, so we grab a pen, some cardboard and we choose our pitch. Perfect. With this baby, I'll be gainfully employed in no time. Inspiring words written, we're able to leave the tutorial area and head into the real world. Someone must be compensating for something. Edenson is now mostly realised, with multiple districts and buildings to explore, but unfortunately there isn't really anything to find when you do so. In Postal 2, most locations served a purpose or had something to find, an awesome weapon or a hidden path to a spooky area. In Postal 4, there are a painful amount of meaningless or empty locations which can make the exploration a bit dull. Graphically, they've pushed the boat out, opting for a more cartoonish approach. It's not a style that will agree with everyone, but I understand the reasoning, specifically for a smaller studio. If you can't make realistic graphics, be quirky. It'll age much slower that way. Would you like to take me back to your place and pay for my deluxe services? Anyway, as I said, we need a job, and so approach citizens around the town, randomly trying our luck to no avail. Hey, need your gutters cleaned by any chance? I wouldn't buy you for a dollar. People don't have time for a nobody trying to catch a break. He really is living than in a society. However, with persistence, we get told about a job agency that might be able to help us. If you want work, just go see that Mr. Bellow guy at the job agency. Get out of here, freeloader. So we set off to seek gainful employment and on the way we discover the game's most vital addition, the scooter, getting us from A to B in pure fucking style. See these rims? $4.99. How about this bumper? Mighty sturdy. You love to see it. The scooter is everything the Segway wanted to be in Postal 3 before it was relegated to a mere escort mission. But who cares? Stop living in the past. We're here now and it's glorious. Pulling up to the job centre, the gaff is empty, which doesn't look promising, but thankfully Joseph pulls up and lays down the law. I've got all the right connections in this town to put you into the right positions where you'll be obediently performing your duty. After which, not only do we get a job opportunity, but as I live and breathe, we get three. All I ask is that I take my standard referral fee. We have to complete each one to finish the day, so we head to the prison to safeguard Edenson's finest. Another wannabe flatfoot who thinks he can last a day in my prison. Now look. Do you see that eye chart over there? Yeah. Good, you're hired. We enter the central chamber where our boss calls through, instructing us to input a code in the command tower. Looking upward, you can see the prison is actually built into the mountain, which is a cool architectural detail. Open roof prisons and media are inherently disturbing. It's like a taunt, showing someone a freedom they can't have. Climbing the tower and inputting the code, it turns out we've done a whoopsie, because boss man is stupid, or illiterate, or stupid and illiterate. He gave us the wrong number. Ah, shit! All the cells are now open and the prisoners are running a mock, killing each other and fixing to take their frustrations out on their hapless guard. I got a backup team on standby, but there's no way they're getting in with the place in full lockdown mode. To prevent further chaos, we have to close the gates, lock the prison down and neutralize the threat, where we get reminded of the classic ethos that made the original so quirky. The game is only as violent as you are. You. We have to keep the prisoners in line and we get given a stun baton to do just that. But also, I mean, like, we do have guns, you know? This is indeed America and we do have guns. And I'm all about reasonable force, don't get me wrong. But they have fists and this guy knows Kung Fu, which makes their fists deadly weapons. They were even attacking me with mops and such. So I had absolutely no choice but to respond in equal measure. 
There's a ton of prisoners with various weapons and levels of aggression, but they're essentially harmless. You mow them down like a train through wet paper. This level is more or less just a combat tutorial. It's the closest mission to the agency, so it makes sense that you'd head here first, and so using it to establish combat in a non-stressful way makes sense. Not that the combat is ever really hard in this game, it's more of a fun addition than a core gameplay loop. The Dark Souls of shooters, this game is not. As a location, the prison's a mixed bag, with some sections appearing very detailed, while others feeling more like a Unity stock asset dump. But I think given time, they'll be able to sound off all the rough edges. If their previous games are anything to go off, they'll keep those updates coming. Culling the prison population, we lock down the three cell blocks, and in doing so, the cavalry pulls up, where we get a look at this out of place Mad Max looking mercenary, and oh boy, do they mean business. I'm sure we'll be the best of friends. In this mission, aggression or passivity doesn't make any difference to the outcome. He treats you the same regardless, even though I'm almost certain in earlier builds he would react differently based on how you handle the prisoners, either being angry or happy with your work. Instead, we have a predetermined cutscene, which you don't want to be the president for the game. Not only is having player choice important, but so is having the world react to it in some way. Play your cards right, and one day you can find yourself a permanent residence in here. With the human touch clearly not working for dude, perhaps we'd be better served working with animals. Enter job two, the animal catcher. We've got a quota of specific wildlife to meet today, and I'm busy in here doing uh, processing, so you'll be handling the legwork. So we have to catch three dogs, three cats, and return them to the van, alive or dead. The sick, sick man. Cats are easy enough, you just have to run into them and they'll automatically be gathered. Whereas the dogs you have to lure over by dropping treats. It's kind of a glorified fetch quest with little else to offer. Excellent. That was the last cat. Animals returned, the van makes a turbulent exit off screen. <laughs> But when the game loads back in, the truck is still just sat there. The cutscenes are completely disconnected from the in-game world in a really jarring manner. Deleting an asset post cutscene is so easy, it's a basic trigger. I understand not having a crashed van outside because that would require modelling and effects, but please just delete the van at least. Finally, when all else fails, there's always sewage work. As George Washington once said, only three things are certain, death, taxes, and needing a shit. Arriving at the job start, you can already see that the devs have been hard at work. Last time I played the game, there was just a random pipe sticking out of the ground, like some Super Mario shit. But now, they have a full-fledged sewer entrance. It's nothing revolutionary, I'm not giving out ribbons for attendance here, but it's good to see proper progression happening. Inside, we meet our new boss. You'll be waiting knee-deep in the excrement of this town's fine citizens. But don't think your hard work is going unappreciated. I'm sure the people up there are thinking of us real thankful like every time they do their business. Down in the dirt, we have three objectives spread across the interconnector tunnels. First, we have to screw in a bunch of light bulbs, which is relatively uneventful. And let there be light. Then we have to shovel shit to unblock all the pipes. <laughs> Blockage cleared, there's only one task left, turning on the pumps. You can find the replacement parts in the nearby storage room. We have to repair the generator by returning four parts, each one dropping the water level when installed. This is indeed a platforming section, made all the more fun by the fact that the pallets will often glitch out and become invisible. The cherry on top? The water's all poopy, so it'll kill you if you swim in it. Platforming in first person games is always a questionable endeavour. The perspective doesn't always lend itself to the mechanic, so if you hate platforming, you might hate this level. In fairness, you can just brute force the majority of this section and eat the damage with healing items. At least the water's not an instant killer or I'd have lost my mind. Returning all the parts and fixing the pump, our work here is done, so we take the newly opened path back to the main room. Along the way, there's even a reference to Civi, whom, if you're watching a video about Postal, you've likely heard of. He even appears as a physical NPC in the game world, which is actually kind of crazy. I mean, I made a successful video about Postal. Where the hell's my reference, Vince, huh? Where's my famous catchphrase? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally pointless in here. Oh, a vacancy has just opened. And by the looks of it, it's the only room available in town. And my word, quite the accommodation it is. Many, many prozies have been murdered here. Ring the bell twice. Got it. We check in with the creepy receptionist. Before being escorted to a dirty alley, we can call home for the night. Don't let the alley rats bite. Crap. <laughs> Waking up, we've been issued with a ticket for public indecency. Apparently, sleeping by the bins is some kind of crime. Bloody system, always trying to keep a man down. Your unconventional means have caught the attention of a business associate of mine. 
Today's task, pay our fine and meet a mysterious contact as instructed by our agent. Post cut scene, we're outside the fire station where a public service announcement is made. We have confirmed at least 50 cases of the deadly Pajona virus here in Edenson. For the uh, simple minded, this is a COVID spoof. And it's honestly like the big C was invented just to give Postal 4 a topical issue to mock, especially given how divisive our fine public is on the matter. NPCs will now don masks and they'll even get angry if the player gets too close. Step aside. Dick! Even the local shops have been updated to include some social distancing tape, outlining the six foot required to queue. Good times. The associate is closest to us, so we head there first. Taking a bus to the commercial district, we find a free pizza on the floor. Sneaking over like a little rat, we take up the opportunity when... We're ambushed. Waking up in an unknown location, rather horrifically, we're being stared down by a mariachi band who appear to have frozen or never had an animation in the first place. I honestly don't know. Dealer's choice. The Hot Wheels version of Bane pulls up and explains the situation. But again, his model is completely frozen. We even swing through his actual face at one point. This genuinely looks like one of those uncanny Half-Life mods you see on the internet. It's crazy. Apparently his organization caused the virus outbreak and he wants us to carry out a series of jobs to prove our worth. But we can still make use of someone like yourself who can operate in the light. I'm sure this relationship will be mutually beneficial, or at least it would be if the game didn't respawn me in the same room with all the models, ourselves included, just T-posing like a bunch of T-shaped fucking idiots. That's what some would call an immersion breaker. Extortion over roll credits, great game, 10 out of 10. More like roll back the save file because the auto save had me stuck here. And if that wasn't bad enough, after reloading like a 10 minute earlier save and trying a second time, it just dumped me under the map. This level is wild, it is broken beyond comprehension. I had to jump into the void, ending up outside some crazy mansion, which I can only assume was the cartel leader's house. I'd love to say this was the only issue I encountered, but this was just the tip of the iceberg. Brains would float in midair, pulling a wily e. coyote off you blasted their head away. The police AI was all over the place. Using a trampoline caused an existential crisis. Moving from one location to another was a 50-50 instant death gamble. Even the little things like the subtitles were broken, spewing out endless overlapping text in a bunch of different languages all at the same time. Yeah, I'll bet. All of this with countless other major glitches to accompany it. Now, some might think I'm being too harsh, but when you're charging 30 quid and claiming a product has moved out of early access, I think you should hold the game to a higher standard. I I mean, I typed that out fairly confidently, but after I ran this script past one of my mates, he was quick to remind me that we both pre-ordered Battlefield 2042, so I'm clearly a f***ing idiot. And even the million dollar budget games are broken messes in this day and age, what can you do? Our first task is some good old fashioned border smuggling, not too dissimilar to the task we carried out in Postal 3. Rip, gone but not forgotten. Now the question is, what are we smuggling? Drugs, weapons, no. We're firing entire human beings. The poor buggers. Bizarre flying targets hover just above the wall and we use a giant car catapult to shoot people into them. Nice shooting. And the hitboxes are so forgiving. You can miss that bitch by a mile and the game's like, damn bro, nice cock. It's an awful mission, to be honest, I shan't lie. Now funny about it, although it does introduce some cool physics based combat. Wooden structures can be destroyed, causing the guards to fall to their death. Environmental combat wasn't used again for some reason, perhaps it was too resource intensive, but they should use more mechanics like this, it offers some pleasant depth to the shooting. Buen trabajo, muchacho. You've done a fine service for your countrymen. Delivering a package is next, and at first I thought, well, it'll be a short mission. What could this task possibly offer? But I'm glad to say they did not disappoint. We arrive at the pet shop and speak to the cashier, who tells us to bring the package to the basement, but warns us not to breathe too deeply. Just not to breathe a whole lot while you're down there. Hmm, okay boss. Taking the steps down, we enter a secret drug lab and I'll be damned if that's not a Breaking Bad reference. This is Gus Fring Super Lab. Maybe if I just take teeny tiny breaths, these toxic fumes won't get the best of me. We drop off the package, all the while dude is complaining about the fumes and just before we can leave, we pass out. Boy, what a hangover. Well, it looks like it's the start of a brand new day. <sighs> Might as well get to work on those errands. Waking up as a mother 
fucking cat. Yes, that was a car blocking the cutscene. Sue me. We now have some cat related tasks to take care of. Getting some milk, bullying a dog and um... It's a completely unexpected diversion to the task and it puts Stray to shame. Can you cut up a dude's nuts in Stray? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. You can pounce, you can climb up walls and you can scratch to your heart's content. Get the balls. Unfortunately, this section hasn't been fleshed out yet either. You can fight other cats, but they literally disappear when you attack them. Ow. Yeah, it's rough, but the foundation is there to be expanded on. Oof. If you awaken from this illusion, we quickly carry out the three other tasks and in doing so, complete the delivery job. Well, that was weird. Before our final objective, we stop at the station to pay off our fine, but get absolutely shafted by the officer. Because instead of paying with good old fashioned money, you have to walk around and ticket cars. So I was glad to discover you actually have a choice. We can just return the fine ourselves. Alert, unpaid ticket detected. Throwing the ticket in, the entire station locks down, and in order to escape, we have to hack four terminals deep within the station. Unlocking high security. It's the most fun I've had up to this point. It felt like classic postal in the most chaotic way. I mean, I say it felt like classic postal, but this mission was more or less in the second game. Hi there. We fight waves of police before hacking the final terminal and making a daring escape. The fuzz hot on our tail. Still under orders from Nacho Teleporte, we have to start a turf war by tagging gang signs in a Wild West reenactment center. I even got scooter jacked on arrival for that authentic experience. Not today, scum. The graffiti is found on billboards and you can actually free spray whatever you want with a variety of colors. It's a nice touch. I can only imagine the number of penises that'll be sprayed here. After our first tag, the rival gang pulls up, but much to our surprise, they're very amicable about the situation. Hey, it's no worry, man. I'll paint over it again tomorrow. It'll be even better too. A mindset that's ruined when the hipster woke crowd turns up. Is that white male culturally misappropriating the techniques of this land's beautiful indigenous minorities? It's a joke, you see, about people getting angry on other people's behalf, even when the people in question are in no way angry. We'll see you cancel who. These guys will swarm the area and protect each of the four billboards with their lives. Last sign sprayed, we get a call from Il Plago. Satisfied with our work, he invites us over to his place for the night, an offer we graciously accept. Excellent work, amigo. Heading to the mansion we teleported to earlier, there's a familiar face to greet us. Your efforts today have earned yourself in extravagant quarters. Au revoir. Oh, and I do hope you enjoy a nice piece of ass. And once again, we're totally screwed. <laughs> After a rude awakening, we meet Edison's mayor. Didn't you used to work out of a bathroom? Dude, the world is my bathroom. He recruits our abilities, wanting to spread the good word of the bidet, which sets up our first task, getting signatures for a petition. Hi there, would you like to sign my petition? Not interested. A task synonymous with postal, and it's more than welcome back. Would you please sign my petition? We have to approach NPCs and ask for their signatures. Sign my petition. What have you got to lose? Unfortunately, the public ain't interested. Sorry, I can't. Crap. Leaving us with only one option. Getting a makeover. Over at the clothing shop, we get to pick ourselves a stylish new fit. We can put on the classic outfit for nostalgia's sake, or, hear me out, we can equip this naughty little number. Whoa, saucy. Opt in for the high heels. Almost everyone will sign this petition first try. Which is not a joke, that's an actual buff you get. Can't turn that down. I mean, who could resist signing something this stud muffin is pushing? Uh, I suppose I have to. Said petition segues perfectly into the next task, installing bidets in a local community. But what's the catch, I hear you say? Well, said community is a cult that appears to worship toilet paper usage, so I don't think they'll be too keen on replacing their idol with a bidet. Entering the old wooden building and taking a lift down, it turns out we've entered some kind of military complex ram packed with toilet roll worshipping soldiers. But like everyone else, their decision making is questionable. <laughs> It's a good level, the base is well designed with plenty of fun shooting galleries and I even pulled out the revolver which is by far the funnest weapon in the game. After installing four bidets, we inadvertently open up the central wiping chamber where we head to finish the task. Stepping in, we discover Tinklage and his mighty throne of shit. George R.R. R. Martin would be prude. I am Tinklage, 
And in your final moments, you will understand that the only thing that should come into contact with man's rear end is the gentle touch of a dead tree. Tinklage is hard to put down, an absolute bullet sponge. And in my many deaths here, I noticed that the dying mechanics in this game are weird. It works with traditional checkpoints and loading, but all of the progress and enemy health stays the same. It's like a bullet hell shooter, but also not at all. It keeps the pace nice and fast, but it also removes any tension because dying really doesn't matter at all. Tinklage slain and the final day installed, our employer is mightily satisfied. And another one bites the dust. We're back in Mexico for our next job, where the streets are literally covered in dookie. Gather all the stuff you can. We move quickly and we'll have enough supply of taco surprise filling to last us the whole month. But had luck, Mexico. They really done you dirty. We have to clean the poopy up and the game recommends using a hose to spray it away, but it runs out of pressure in seconds and you're stuck to the spot, making you a massive, stupid, hose-wielding target. <laughs> The shovel is by far superior, it tears through that shit, pun intended. But by playing it safe, we managed to clean the streets with vigorous precision. That'll teach those bandits. This shit belongs to America. Canny Island's up next, where we have to crash the grand opening of a brand new theme park. Best way we can crash this opening is to shut off the park's power. And uh, I have to be careful what I show here. The park's based off of Crotchy's female counterpart, and everything within is aptly related. As such, this section is at high risk of the old age restriction. And given the fact that my last video was taken down for copyright before anyone could even watch it, I'll lose my house if this video doesn't have ads. There are five power boxes we either have to destroy or turn off by hand. Shit's like a fever dream. Power box is destroyed, we make our way out, and we're ambushed by the park's DJ, who's seething about our disruptions. Bring it on! That's right, baby, Connie to the rescue. Having been swayed to our side by a bribe I slipped her earlier. Crazy plot twist. The DJ can actually be killed prior to this scene, but the game just says, nope, take backsies, she's here again. But thankfully, with the help of Connie, it's a cakewalk. Wednesday was the most entertaining of the bunch so far, and while it treads familiar ground, each mission actually felt fleshed out and worthwhile, which isn't always the case. Ugh. Wrapping the day up, we head north to stay at a lovely wooden lodge. Cool, we're really moving up in the world. Dinging the bell twice, we're greeted by our old creepy cat friend who settles us in. A pleasant night's rest so far from civilization. You'll be alone, isolated, secluded, Free from the prying eyes of developed society. How very shining. Hey, I don't have to pay for the return ticket, do I? The next morning, things start off interesting. Ah, shit. All my stuff's gone. Somebody must have snuck in and taken it. I wonder if this has anything to do with the sudden disappearance of Champ as well. Champ is gone, stolen by a hillbilly cannibal cult, along with all our equipment. Something tells me this is going to be an interesting morning. The shack we start in is great to explore. Far more detailed than the majority of locations with creepy music and weird interactable totems. No. I love when running with scissors opt for the spookier designs. Their Apocalypse Weekend DLC was a blast and focusing on that vibe is more than welcome. Either my head wound is kicking in or some game designer was smoking crack. A red hue is covering the area and dungaree killers are waiting around every corner. Our gear is randomly spread across the wooded area and we have to grab them and free Champ to escape. Although some sections are entirely broken, like the water pits you can fall into. The game just died on me, behaving like I wasn't in water, which meant I was completely stuck. I had to glitch myself to get back out. Other than that, there are huts and woods and caves to traverse, all accompanied by random whispering and wailing. There is a lot they can do with this area to really hammer home the creepiness. It just needs a few tweaks, which would appear to be the running theme throughout this game. It has potential, it's just not exactly there yet. Anyway, gear returned and champ saved. We're able to head back to normal society. Well, somewhat normal. I wonder what the rest of the day has in store for us. You've been up to some crazy shit around town, dude. We know you've been two-timing us with the city. Well, as I live and breathe, Vince, the creator of Postal in the virtual flesh, this time playing the role of mafioso gang leader, and he has an offer we can't refuse. Do what I tell you, and maybe. The family will take care of you. I'm gonna make you an offer. Can I just refuse it? This ain't the movies, jerk off. So we're working for Vince today, just like old times. Pit boss is the closest task, so we head over. 
The casino district. Tall buildings, empty buildings, money's gun in blow. Wow, this really is the city that sometimes sleeps. And our duties take us right to a local gambling establishment. Stop your vice, roll the dice. Just outside, there's a group of anti-gambling protesters and based off of our past experiences. Come on everyone, follow me. These dudes will be a problem. So I took preemptive measures. What can I say? I'm a forward thinker, big, massive brain. Inside, we have to keep the guests happy at all costs, as Vince is quick to point out. Walk the casino floor and make sure all the clients are happy. After a short while, Vince calls to say someone is misbehaving. Looks like we got a clown on the floor that needs a little extra attention. But it marks no one, so you have to kill everyone you see in the hopes that you get the troublemaker. And I'm not sure if this is a joke or just poorly thought out mechanics. It does however highlight an issue with reviewing this game. It's hard to tell what's intentional and what's just plain broken. The counting room's in trouble, so we mooch over only to find the money gone and the casino, as predicted, under attack. That ball of yours is about to deliver us a big payout. From here, a countdown begins. The building is about to blow and we have seven minutes to stop it, which sounds like it should be epic, but for some reason there's absolutely no sense of urgency. I think it's the lack of music. Get some Aerosmith playing and this shit will be hot. Having to extinguish a fire every five steps also kills the momentum. Like, we get it, you have water and fire mechanics. It's very impressive, but also very boring. Funny, that's what my therapist said. You make our way through, guns are blazing, and eventually stop the final few protesters in the vault. Even bagging a fat stack for our troubles, Vince truly is a generous benefactor. Consider it a tip from me. And to show our gratitude, we head over to the town hall to rig an election for him. Inside, we have to hand over all our weapons, which can only mean one thing. Something will probably go wrong. Now we can either resolve this with weapons we scavenge around the office, or we can head to the back and cast our vote. But there's a problem. Not an unexpected attack or a natural disaster. It's a random game-breaking problem. In the voting area, there's an inconspicuous looking room, and if you enter, it locks the door behind you and it will not open again. Maybe it's no. Maybe no. This happens every time you enter. There's an underground tunnel you can take, but the exit is locked and you're just stuck here, wondering what the fuck the purpose of this area is. The tunnel is literally never used, no matter how you choose to handle this task, so I don't know what purpose it serves. You can only assume it's a leftover development relic or artifact, but it's frustrating. After loading an earlier save, I wasn't feeling quite so democratic, so I took the easy way out. Being able to find a bunch of weapons in the building kind of made handing ours over a bit pointless. It would be cool if this mission were almost a Hitman spoof, where we had to get inventive with the environment to kill them, maybe dropping the podium on them, or just something like that to make it that bit more interactive and stand out. But as it stands, our decision to go guns blazing has not been well received. Fighting our way through, helicopters will chase us down until the wanted level is cleared, but we can rest easy knowing that we've done our part for democracy. Just next to the voting building, we're summoned to test a new game. Inside, we enroll our abilities, whacking on a super advanced headset to explore this new virtual reality. Dying in the same kind of also means dying in real life. There are five levels to pass through and they're surprisingly robust. I was expecting to just shoot through a few combat arenas, but was happily surprised to see genuinely engaging environmental puzzles from shifting platforms to avoiding giant Pac-Man-like AIs, all contained within this fairly intriguing techno world. But of course, this this is postal, and on the third level the floor breaks, offering us a choice. Continue the trials as expected, or break into the secret developer section. Um, just ignore the care. That's just a, uh, a branching storyline path. Jumping down, the narrator protests that we stay away and not continue. Wait! Don't go any further! You're not supposed to be here! Ignoring him, things get progressively crazier and less organized until eventually the system turns against us. Get him! We have to fight defensive AIs while jumping through this bizarre digital maze and it's all just really well done. Although all this hard work is ruined in the last act because when you finally get to the end of the maze, the game just dumps you in the alley without any ceremony or explanation. It's a really disappointing way to round off an otherwise very good mission. Regardless, there's only one objective left, fixing the race. The track is based inside a giant nuclear tower and inside we discover what's expected of us. The red scooter has got to win. 
the good thing about this mission is that it subverts your expectation. In any other game, you'd have to win the race in a painfully hard to control vehicle and it would be dull as dishwater. Yes, I'm looking at you, Mafia. Wake up! But here, our objective is only to make sure the Red Scooter wins, which means we can spend the race sabotaging and destroying the competition. Once we've ran them into the dirt, you can either try to beat the Red Scooter, much to our boss's annoyance, or stick to the plan and let him win, giving our clients a big payday. What can I say? I'm not a gambling man, but you might say I had a real hunch about this race. Thursday's a weird one, because there's a huge range in quality of the content presented. The casino defense and voting farce were dull and predictable, whereas the race and tester tasks were engaging and surprising. It's a very mixed bag indeed. Jobs complete, much like the previous nights, our boss invites us to crash at his place, something Postal Dude is understandably skeptical about. Perhaps these supposed nightly accommodations have been nothing but a ruse all along. I think we've outsmarted him this time. Good evening, my dear dude friend. Get on in there. This is going to be a big night. Time to get made. <laughs> Now this is the life. The following morning, we're grabbed by Vince and taken to meet the big boss, who really just hammers home the Fallout New Vegas references. I am known as the boss. I have been watching you. Everything that has transpired this week has been engineered by myself to bring you here to me. For nothing escapes my all-seeing eye. So this is the boss, and he has three last objectives for us to carry out, and in turn, he'll tell us where our stolen trailer is. By the day's end, none who dare oppose me will. Cool. As with every other day, we start with the nearest objective, pacifying Merc Superior. Also, have I mentioned that they managed to get John St. John as a voice actor for Postal Dude? Yes, the voice of Duke Nukem is a canonical Postal voice. Look at my ass. Along with three others, including the original Postal Dude and even Zach Ward, the actor that portrayed Dude in the UV Bowl adaptation. <laughs> It's a lovely touch. Every line is covered by the respected actor and they bring their own personality to the role. Aw, oh, shit. All my stuff's gone. The mercenary group are at a shopping centre, having taken it over and fortified the area. Why have they done this? Who knows, but the murk in question is none other than the badass we saw at the prison back on Monday. The lead is hiding on the top floor, and each level has a pair of unpassable gates we have to deactivate before moving up. It's a pacing mechanic, something to stop us just skipping straight to the top. And I mean, look at all these soldiers, it would be rude to just ignore them. Whoops, finger slipped. Reaching the top, we begin the epic battle against Merc Superior. Who is stupidly easy to beat, because they don't move if you corner peek them. Superior, my pasty ass. Once defeated, we walk over and make a shocking discovery. You don't remember me from the date? From the wedding? Are you telling me you don't recognize your own sister-in-law? You're the bitch's younger sister. Where's my sister? I was hoping you'd be able to tell me where that bimbo is. That no good, conniving, bloated, worm-witted, lying, thieving man-stealer. Wait. Man stealer? Mm. Mm. Okay, so let's get this right. She's our ex wife's younger sister, and she tracked us down and done everything she could to kill us because she loves us. Okay, let's just move on from the sister plot as swiftly as the game did. On to our next objective, treasure hunting. When you hear the term, who comes to mind? Nathan Drake, Tomb Raider, 80% of TLC's 90 Day Fiancés and now Postal Dude because we arrive at an old cave to find some. Entering, we discover a vast cavern which looks ready to blow at any moment. But we need this artifact, so we power on, taking a rickety old lift to the lower depths. Back off, claim jumper. These sacred tombs and burial sites belong to us. Unfortunately, at the bottom, fellow tomb raiders call finders keepers, which means we have more fodder for the cannon. <laughs> Along the way, all kinds of familiar tropes will spring out, all of which are expertly navigated by yours truly. Make sure you drop a like and sub for those elite reflexes. You know you want to. 5k likes and I'll review Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb. 
Eventually we stumble across a huge chamber with an ancient Mayan temple at the center. Heading inside, we navigate the twisting stone corridors and I cannot tell if it's an asset dump because it all feels so different to the rest of the game. Clearing the traps, we find what we're looking for, a golden alien skull. I was expecting some sort of trap when we took the skull, but that wasn't the case. Instead, we're ambushed by, as I'm sure you would have guessed, a gimp suit gang? We're taking this place back right now. Yeah, sure, fuck it, why not? Just add them to the pile. Bring back all the notes that made Postal 2 slap. I'm the damn gimp. Our mysterious boss has one last task, inspecting the Edison Dam. We pass through a museum before arriving at our inspection area, only to discover that things are falling apart. Well, you see, we've got some leak problems cropping up throughout the dam. It's not an emergency or anything, but every emergency containment door has been activated, and unless someone down there can start repairing all of the leaks, this whole place is gonna burst! Well, I suppose I've got nothing better to do right now. The walls are leaking, and we have to plug the holes, all of which are shaped so, well, conveniently. Leaks, however, are the least of our troubles because a group of activists turn up with the aim of poisoning Edison's water. My children, we are poised for triumph, for the end is near. Mm-mm, Agent 47, you're going down. We still have to plug the leaks, but now we're on a timer and this group will do everything it can to stop us. Personally, this section goes on for way too fucking long. After about four rooms, I was like, surely this has to be it. But nope, more and more. If that wasn't bad enough, the worker doesn't shut. Up. Don't look down, but it looks like that mixing device is almost ready to pump some nasty looking stuff into the water supply. If you're gonna drag out a section, please do not punctuate it with an annoying ass that endlessly repeats the same line of dialogue. Use anything you can in that room to plug the leak! I actually ran out of time on this playthrough, which the game just allows. There's no difference in the outcome. The timer is pointless. And again, is this a funny joke or just unfinished? We'll never know. We seal all the remaining leaks, find the poison device and get treated to this cutscene. You even caught that one invisible structural failure. Wait, what invisible structural failure? Kidding. Objectives complete, the big boss calls us one last time to outline the grand conclusion to this tale. There's one last obstruction that you must overcome. In a full circle moment, we have to kill the many bosses that have used and abused us over the week, and it's actually a really good way to round the game off. We actually get revenge for all the shit we've dealt with. Oh, and the apocalypse is on again. No, another one of these. Typical, just, just bleeding typical. Civilians will attack on sight and cats are raining from the sky. Just a common occurrence in the world of Postal. If you've played Pacifist up to this point, the game will automatically skip these missions and progress to the end of the game. It's great that they've allowed and thought about the Pacifist route, but I'd love to see a more dishonored style take on these missions in the future. Having the option to dispatch them in non-lethal but utterly ridiculous fashion would be a great addition. To begin this slaughter, we head over to Mayor Bidet. Using a highly advanced scanner, we pass through the front gates and into his shitty compound. Your ass better be tighter than a nutcracker, cause I'm about to go knuckle deep, dude. Thankfully, as with the previous game, a well-timed kick can turn those missiles to our advantage. And with enough kick back, Mike kicks the bucket. Vince is surrounded by guards and he puts up one hell of a fight, but despite his best efforts, he cashes his last check. Requiesque de pache, you Lego suit wearing bastard. Finally, given all the troubles his abduction caused us on Tuesday, I made sure to save El Plago for last, the puta. Driving over to Mexico as the sirens ring, we enter his compound. So you've come to catch me, pendejo? Tengo los huevos de acero. The front doors are locked, so we follow the carefully constructed path around the side of his mansion, and it's a really good section. Some fun shooting areas and a sense of build-up as you work your way through, into the mansion and upstairs, where we confront Plago in his office. And here we fight, mono a mono, man on man. That is to say, I was hiding around the corner and throwing birds in until he died. Adios el plago, tu madre es muy fiel. Boss is culled, we're summoned a final time to the tower. Based on the kind-hearted and reasonable nature thus far, I'm sure he'll have something good for us. It's time I formally introduced myself to you. Son. I am your father. Father, yeah, I got that when you said son. The fact that his father isn't dead and wears the same jacket as the man from Postal 1, it's possible that Postal Dude is the son of the maniac from the first Postal game, a long running theory in the community. But who cares, because right now we have an epic battle on our hands, father against son engaged in a mortal combat. I just banned birds again. 
It's so fucking deadly, honestly. Nerf patch any day. This is a rocket launcher's damage. This is the damage of throwing a birdcage. It's easy mode. Father defeated, we're treated to one last interaction. I regret nothing except you. And when all hope seems lost, the bitch's sister pulls up to save us and then disappears into thin air. Whew, thanks. I wouldn't have expected that you... Huh? It's a bizarre and confusing moment. I feel like her character needs an update to properly integrate her into the plot. At the moment, she feels more like a placeholder. Out of respect, we leave milk on the table, we take the lift down, cross the city and arrive back where it all started. Leaving through the same gate we arrived at many days ago. In the end, they still lack the one thing that they had sought after, their beloved trailer home. But while it seems like the fat lady had sung for our dynamic duo, Sometimes that corpulent old gal can hoist herself over to expose one last grand aria from those luscious lips of hers. A new alternator, modern AC, vintage patina. When it comes to the dude's home, the endless sky is the roof over his head, the unending country roads his personal driveway, and every street corner his personal bathroom. Isn't that just a wholesome ending? Postal and Champ ride off into the sunset once more in search of whatever shenanigans the world will offer them next. So as I've said many times in this video, Postal 4 is a mixed bag and that is putting it nicely. There's occasional spouts of fun and it's laid a decent foundation but it's nowhere near finished and an excessive number of bugs shit on the experience. If you're going to buy this game, only do so because you want to support the developers and help see this project reach its full potential. I have no doubt they'll see it through. They were still updating a 20 year old game only a few years ago. They're not the type to abandon a project. That said, there's still one point I want to talk about. The game's controversial nature, or in this case, lack thereof. In my last video, I spoke in great detail about the franchise's historical controversial nature, from multiple worldwide bans to its offensive stereotypes. Postal 2 was a crazy game. <laughs> Postal 4 comes nowhere near that same level of outrage, which is probably for the best. Not because I think it would be cancelled or anything like that, but I think it would come across tryhard, maybe even cringy if they attempted to double down. Instead, it's more of a light-hearted comedic theme. Do you see that eye chart over there? Yeah. Good, you're hired. I think in a year or so, I'll come back and see what's changed and hopefully it'll be more finished and enjoyable. If you wanna see that, then hey, make sure you like this video and subscribe. And come on, you made it this far. Why not help a dude reach 400,000 subscribers? It's the moral thing to do. I hope you enjoyed this thorough look at Postal 4. I wish the devs the best of luck in crafting their vision and I'll see you next time. Much love, bye bye. This is the story about a man who once had it all and in his own particular postal way, he still does.